Hey everyone, this is Todd Latore from Queensryche, and you're listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Did, look at look at Bruce's hair. <laughs> Sorry for the kitchen. It's not as cool as your Kelly custom shops back there, but <laughs> right. <laughs> that is a nice fucking guitar. Thank I'm not you. gonna lie. Thank you, man. Um, yeah, I've got. Uh, let's see. This one. I don't know if you can see. This one was uh, in the Queensrÿche video, Light Years. This is a, a comparison V. Oh, yeah, you I've got uh, here, I'll do it real quick. I've got <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is right up Chris's alley. I got some oh, more, yeah. uh, Kelly's. I've got um, I have the very first, I'll show you this. This is the very first uh, BC Rich uh, Mockingbird of the Extreme series. Oh my through. god! This one actually doesn't have a serial number on it because it was the very first one ever made, and all their product shoot they did was with this actual guitar. So if you ever see any of the the, the magazines or any ads showing the uh, the the Mockingbird, this is the actual guitar you're looking at from the photographs. Wow! And oh, then wow. Uh, I've got some other cool stuff in cases i have a metal church it was it was only two ever made so it's the 100th anniversary explorer metal church that they gave me wow and it was oh. in, it was in one of their videos and then i have a mirrored um i'll show you this one then we'll start <laughs> i could this do this one. all day i have another comparison v hardtail 27 fret this one here is truly a one of a kind. This is a custom mirror, oh, cracked mirror. Oh, wow. It's not like the the $1200 ones you see. This is this is actual real mirror. It's not wow. flex. Even the inlay. That is How inlays, heavy is it? Oh, uh, it's not bad. No. I mean, it's not too bad. No. Mike Shannon built this. Um that is a beautiful yeah, guitar. It's, uh, wow. It's got the EMG. It's got a, uh, just a single volume, and it's got a reverse headstock, all in cracked mirror. Yeah. yeah this, is, this is probably one of my most value, valuable guitars. Um, That's a beautiful. But, you know, I get a uh, artist artist deal through jackson right oh so, yeah i had to i had to uh to pay for that one but nothing like what it would what it would cost right <laughs> right yeah. but yeah they're like hey hey the artist deal only goes so far yeah, that that guitar is probably worth probably eight grand maybe a little more how often do you play it i never play that one <laughs> Every, every every other one that's hanging up I play um I've got a bass here that Eddie Eddie Jackson gave me it's a Spectre oh and uh yeah I got some other Kellys I got uh some str a Strat down there and acoustics and whatever so yeah Good see you, now man. I have I'm gonna show my wife this video the next time she says you have too many guitars and I'm gonna be like <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be like hey listen I'm just reaching for the stars here <laughs> oh, you're, he's gone. He's th you there, Todd? What's that jingling? My, my drink. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear right, me? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, Can you hear you're me? back. Yeah, you were yeah. frozen. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. I wonder okay. if I should try to switch to... Uh, I guess it doesn't matter if I'm on Wi-Fi or... If I'm in my studio also, so I use an ex uh, a Wi-Fi extender. Right. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm etherneted into this because I thought it would be it would be better. Normally, it's not an issue, but if it freezes a here and there... Yeah, we'll yeah. make it work. No problem at all. So you want to jump right in then? Let's do it. So I'll jump right in first. I mean, the new album, Digital Noise Alliance, is due out in October. I think October 7th, right? 
and you yeah. released and you released a single forest what was the rationalization for releasing a ballad first that's kind of not well that's sort of atypical isn't it actually it's the second song we put out the first the first song we put out is called in extremis okay and and that's that's a, a rocker you know um you know more of a driving heavier tune um and then the second one we put out was forest actually so normally you know we would do you know you would put two or three songs out then maybe introduce a ballad but right. since we, we put the first one out that was a a heavier tune yeah so normally normally we put out a couple and then you know then introduce a ballad this time we thought uh let's just throw a curveball and put the ballad out there and uh I think it was the right move. I mean, it, again, everybody's putting out heavy stuff all the time. Right. And this was just a really nice change of pace and a shift from all of the, all of that that's happening everywhere. And uh, it's a very relatable song. I mean, everyone is going to lose a parent or a sibling or a very close loved one. So, but if you haven't seen in extremis, um, you can go on YouTube and, and put that in and check that first release out. So for me, because I follow Queens on social media, I know the new record was coming out and I saw in extremis. So Bruce, okay. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and that song made it into my like top 10 playlist almost instantly. Um, That's cool. For a lot of reasons, because I find that, that like a lot of like older bands, bands that have been around, I don't mean older, but bands have been around for a while. Mm-hmm. They kind of just phone in recordings as an excuse to tour, you know? But this song hit me like, I was listening, I was like, holy shit. I turned it on in my car, I cranked it up, and I just was like, okay, I got to listen to that again. Okay, I got to listen to that again. I got to listen to that again. So I listened to it like three, four times in a row. And for a lot of reasons, first of all, the song is great. But for me as a recording engineer, the production is also just great. You know, Zeus, Zeus did a killer job with the production on, on the whole record. Everything sounds very crisp and clear and defined. And it's not, I don't know if you remember, there was like this loudness war thing happening for a while. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, he leaves some, some headroom there to where, um, you're not, it doesn't sound like squashed and like everything's up on the verge of clipping. I mean, you can turn it all the way up in your car and it still sounds super clean and clear. And uh, yeah, I mean, the production on the record is, is, is awesome. The drums, you know, there's no sound replacements on the drums. They're a hundred percent legit. You know, and I, uh, we, go ahead. I saw you say that in an interview where you said there's no sound replacement. I was just like, okay, I got to go back and listen. And the thing about the drum sounds are, is that they're so modern like the toms especially have this like attack with a lot of boom and not a lot of that mid range in there, but it, it still sounds like a tom instead of like a, some yeah. kind of manipulated. The room that the drums were recorded in was this huge, really ridiculous room. It was, it was recorded at Hulk Hogan's old house, this big <laughs> 18,000 square foot mansion. And the ceilings were just ridiculous with these wood beams and, it was just the most amazing drum room. And so, um, yeah, everything in there is like just a hundred percent legit. Well, and the thing is, is, is a lot of, um, people will go through all this time to mic up the drums properly. And, and, and you spend all this time with your technique of properly miking everything only to find out later, a lot of, most of these bands end up, replacing it with yeah. some other drum sound and we were like what's the point of that so it, there was zero sound replacement on the drums they sound really big you can hear the room um and uh yeah just the full production on this was was really great and it was a lot of fun because michael wilton brought over all of his amps that were used on the warning not the ep but the warning rage for order um, mind crime empire and promised land so oh. so when we recorded the guitars instead of just saying okay here's the rhythm guitar sound for the album 
we did it song by song and he would play and then he would go, eh, let me try the mind crime app. And he would plug that head in and oh, we would God. listen to it and he'd go, eh, and, and then he would go to the rage for order one. And depending on the feel of that song, he said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to track this, this rhythm channel with the rage for order amp. And then when I do the doubled rhythm track, maybe I'll use the warning so there was a lot of experimentation happening um, with regard to the guitar amps and all that kind of, and he even took, he brought out his old flanger pedal that was used on, uh, I think it was on the Lady War Black, like the original pedal. So he right. brought, so he, it was, you know, very, I hate to say, because it's everybody says it was organic. It was super organic where we weren't using our Kempers that we always use, which are amazing profilers. But we didn't use any of that. Everything was like old school amps and different guitars and um, and that kind of thing. So even like the snare tunings changed for like the the, the ballad. You know, we 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 use different uh, snare tunings for that, and it was a lot of fun to make. Nice. This is this kind of goes back to my original point. Like a lot of older bands, they just they record so they can tour and they don't really put a lot of effort into the recording at least that's the way it feels a lot of the time like but with this record it seems like there was so much time attention and detail and it you took your you took your time to not only write the songs but to get the recording and the production and the mixes the way that you wanted them yeah you know you know what the the thing is is I don't know what kind of budgets other bands get. It just depends. Right. Yeah. But you know, a lot of artists will get an X amount of dollars for an advance and they'll try to go the cheapest way out. Like, okay, what's the, the least ex least cost we can put into this record so that we can pocket the rest. And we don't do that. We're just like, you know what? The record is forever. And that's what the recording advance is for. It's for the recording. So, you know, Queensryche takes quite a while to make, to record a record. And if it takes us, if we have to spend every red cent of that budget on whatever it takes to do the record properly, that's what we do. So we're not interested in, you know, I mean, obviously we're, we're conscious of the expenses, but we're, we're not trying to like, take the low the low ball route right. and and you know record it ourselves and pay somebody to mix it and master it like we hire the best because we think that our music deserves that and and you and, can tell the difference yeah and the audience that's buying your product you want them to have the best product that their money can buy and so we care about that so yeah I I mean, uh, we take a lot of pride and a lot of care into every single tiny little detail of the the writing process, the recording process, the artwork, the packaging, everything. You know, I mean, it's very important to us. This is our product. This is how we earn a living, you know, and we want we want the end result to sound as great as it can. And, and when you you hire some guy that'll do it for a fraction of the price. I mean, a lot of times you get what you pay for and we don't want to take the cheap route. So, and I think your fans are spending their hard earned money as well. Right. I mean, times are tough. That's if, what they're, I'm saying. if they're putting their money into this record that they worked all week for a little extra, it's gotta be, it should be the best it can be. Absolutely. And, and the other thing is like, I mean, it's a reflection of us too. Like you, you don't want to have, it's like, it's like building a car, uh, doing a custom car, and you got all the body work and everything's straight and ready. And then you you take it to Mako for some, you know, single <laughs> stage bullshit paint job. Right. You're like, no, man, I want fucking this many, this, this base coat. I want so many coats of clear. And then may, you don't want orange peel. So you're going to wet sand and buff it and polish it out. Like you go through all the work to write the shit. Why wouldn't you go the full distance? And yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of music out there to choose from you wouldn't want to do a disservice to a great song by having uh it could be like having a great screenplay and using shitty cameras to film the movie like no you use state-of-the-art professional stuff that's industry 
standard and you go with the right people that know how to do video treatments and dialogue editing if it needs it and lighting and all of these things, you know, so hopefully people appreciate the production and the quality that went into it. Well, I really appreciate it. And the, one other thing I noticed about these recordings is there's a real cohesiveness to the writing and the performances. And it, it made me remember being young and being in the studio with a band and everyone was in the studio at the same time. Were you guys there predominantly like in the studio together the whole time or were you just showing up for your parts or was it kind of a mix of everything? No, everyone was there a hundred percent of everything. So normally what we've done in the past is song write from each person's house and then everybody kind of sends ideas and then you build them as you get that piece of the pie you start adding your stuff to it and then you reshare it and then eh, you probably have a bunch of demos in various forms but pretty much here's songs and then in pre-production you strip the songs away and you start going through all, through it all what we did on this record was everybody got together at my place and Zeus flew down and we did three or four like couple week, you know, songwriting sessions. Maybe it was four sessions. I can't remember. And it was zero using old hard drives, no rehashing of old ideas, not reworking old ideas of stuff that was good, but didn't make the last record. We, we were like, Everything's going to be brand new from scratch. We've never heard this before. Let's start. So we would all be in my studio. Casey would get on the drums. Michael would have a guitar riff or he would show the riff and Casey would get into it. I'd start humming some ideas in my head. Eddie would, you know, and so we all were building. So the, the good part about that was when it came time for pre-production, it wasn't like, oh, I don't really like that riff because we already agreed on stuff as we were writing it and Zeus would be recording the writing sessions. So we were trimming off all the fat as we would go along. Um, when it came to the recording, we all got together. Everybody was there for every single drum hit that Casey played. Um, and then after the drums, we moved on to guitars. And so like Michael Stoney came in later and, and recorded guitars, but Michael would, record guitars from say noon to three and then we would take a break and then from like uh you know maybe four or five o'clock until nine or ten o'clock at night i would sing so we would split the day up between guitar and then i'd say hey i'm i'm kind of worked i'm gonna take tomorrow off i'll work on some lyric ideas or whatever but i'm not singing tomorrow okay so Michael would do more guitars and then Eddie would come in and start laying bass tracks. So by the time I started singing more, these songs already had drums. A lot of them already had bass and we kind of start filling in the gaps. But I mean, I was, you know, I'm not going to watch everything Michael plays because I don't want to sit there all day and watch him play. But, you know, I would come in and or Eddie and I would start preparing food for dinner. We would grill out in the back, uh, you know, my place every night or yeah. whatever um so everybody was there for every part of the process which was was really cool because you know you're getting feedback in real time or if i was like hey do you guys like this better or this better and i could get a a head count or a, you know a vote on what everybody kind of liked and so it, it made it just completely it was the most collaborative effort in every aspect um on this record since I joined the band because nice. of those reasons. Yeah. I, the reason I asked that question is because when I heard an extremist the first time, I thought instantly, this sounds like a young band that's ready to roll. That's like, great. you know, and, and that's why I asked that question because you can, you can, I often think that music has, a, has an energy, right. That people can feel and, and that energy gets recorded, whether it's in ones and zeros or magnetic, it doesn't matter. And that energy comes out of the speakers. Maybe that's a little too spiritual or whatever. Or <laughs> no. Hokey pokey. But, but the, you know, like a good song that's recorded with a bunch of people that, that aren't really working together, that can work. I mean, it worked for Fleetwood Mac Rumors, but it also doesn't work a lot of the times. You know, right? I agree. And, and I mean, you can't force chemistry, 
So that's why a lot of these super groups don't amount to a lot. They're amazing in their own right and in their respective bands that they're known for. But just because you put a bunch of great musicians together doesn't mean they're going to create anything magical. Right. Um, there's also something you said about that translation. For example, you know, we've all had shitty jobs when we were younger. And for those of you that ever had a, a sales in telemarketing or anything that has to do with the phone, you know, one of the things to say is, hey, this is Chris. How are you? When you smile as you're speaking, you can hear that smile. Right. right? Yeah. And so kind of that that same idea, I think, translates in somebody just kind of going through the motions or somebody really digging in and, right. and laying that groove down or giving a vocal delivery. Like you could hear that that energy and that passion. Um, I think that translates the same way as like a phone call where you can't see the other person, but you can you can hear that smile. You can hear that enthusiasm um, right. or whatever it is, whatever it is that they're evoking. You know, you can that translates through the dialogue. Same thing happens with, I think, anyone playing an instrument or singing. Um, yeah. you, you can hear that in the well, delivery. What's it like playing? Because you guys are out on the road a lot lately and you're playing with like hall of famers or i mean rock and roll hall of famers what's it like playing with guys that you used to idol i mean because you're about the same age as me right we grew up listening to the same shit scorpions and priest and yeah. how, gr how great is it to be out on the road with those guys it's awesome i mean i remember um i remember there was one time we did a sound check so we we were out with priest for six weeks not long ago and we're go actually going out with them again in October and November. Um, oh, please come back to DC. <laughs> uh, I'll have to check the dates, but but nevertheless, um, you know, we we were doing a sound check, and uh, we were there was something that the guys wanted to go over in Queen of the Reich, and so we decided to play it. And as we start the song, you know, um, there's Rob you know, Rob Halford, he's like, I don't know, 30 feet away, 20, 30 feet away right. from the front of the stage. And he's just kind of standing there. He's the only one in the room minus a couple staff people walking around and like our, our, our sound guy. And he just stood in the very center and watched. And I'm, Yikes. and there's that part of me where you're thinking like, wow, like not only did I grow up loving this guy's voice, but then you're like, you get into music and you're in a band and you're like, you know, wow, it would be amazing if any one of these guys knew who I was in a musical context. Like maybe there could be a mutual respect of some kind. I could be viewed as uh, a peer, et cetera. And so there's that moment where you go, dude, I'm literally singing Queen of the Reich. <laughs> I'm, I'm nailing it at soundcheck. And there's Rob Halford undivided attention watching us do sound check and he kind of walked then he walked over to the side and he's listening you know listening to the room and that was really cool and and being on tour with him you know I'd, I'd be taking a shower you know after our show eat, eat dinner and then okay I'm tired and I'm going to take a shower and call it a night and I would hear you know um living after midnight or I'd hear painkiller you know as I'm in the shower like you can hear in the, right in the bowels of the arena, you can hear the the music, and you 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 know the song because you can hear it, or breaking the law, you know, or whatever. Right. And 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 you're thinking like, wow, I remember being 18 right. and watching the paint 19, whatever it was, watching the Painkiller tour. These guys were untouchable, and now I can watch. I'm on tour with them right. in Queensrÿche as direct support for for Judas Priest and. Rob walks by me in the hallway and he says hi and it's like it's cool. It's that's yeah. pretty wild. Here, here, here's a question: Did you touch the bike, dude? I fucking sat on it. Yes. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Where's my phone? I didn't. I. I, I didn't know if that was allowed or not. Uh, you know. Before the interview's over, I'll show you. I think I left my phone in the studio, but yeah, I have, like. 
Go ahead. No, no, finish that up. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So when we we walked there and behind the you know where the drums are, and he has like this vocal kind of dressing room tented thing. And there's a chair, like a director's chair on the back. It says metal God. Oh, and, dude. and there, and there's a skull on like this desk, this table. And he has his leather hat sitting on the skull and his, all of his glasses are on the table. There's the set list. And then there's a bunch of clothing, you know, stage wear. And then, and the bike sits there. So every day we would pull up, you know, and, uh, I, I, I'd have a smoke and I'd have my coffee and like their semis are loading stuff in and, you know, they'd roll the bike. And every day I saw that motorcycle, you know, <laughs> and it was behind the thing. And I was like, I said, I looked around and I go, I wonder if anyone would give a shit if I took a picture of it. I don't think so. And then I was like, well, what if I just sat on it? Like <laughs> what's going to happen? Nice. Right. So, so their, their stage manager, Rick, I said, Hey man, um, he goes, Hey, when we played with, with, you know, Ozzy and like Zach or Ozzy, like they would push him out on the bike, you know, with all the smoke and all this, they would push him through the the curtain. And he's like, do you want to, you know, push the bike? I go, dude, if I push the bike, I'm going to push the bike and then jump over the sissy bar and ride bitch. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap my arms around Halford and right. go out on stage and I, I'm gonna be part of their show. And you're not letting go, play. right? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, Hey man, if you want to push the bike, you can go out there and push the bike. I said, I'm telling you, I'm gonna jump on the back seat and roll, <laughs> and roll on stage. Anyway, they were super cool. And I sat on the I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna sit on the bike. So I sat on nice. the bike and, and and uh our our one of our, our stage manager took a uh took a picture of me on the bike and i was like you want one he's like i don't know dude i go get on the bike so he sat on the bike <laughs> nice took a picture all right so i got a question for you because you sort of just alluded to it but why do you think the the internet or more specifically like blabbermouth or those metal sites are so interested in like every time you take a shit you and michael sweet i mean all <laughs> we see is like todd it, Todd has quit smoking or Todd is not quitting smoking or, or Michael sweets it. Every time I log on to the fucking website, that's all I see is Todd is doing something. Why dude, is that? Dude, listen, I get thousands. <laughs> I, I, it must, I must have thousands of dollars in free press. So if I, if I call the governor of Texas, a fucking idiot, it's on blabbermouth. If I, I, if I say, you know, Dudes, wear, wear a mask like we're trying to get back to work that all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm this, you know, socialist, commie, <laughs> hard, you know, it doesn't whatever. make sense because even they do it with Michael Sweet, too. Every time he sneezes, they Dude, get listen, a little it's, it's fucked it's, up. It's it's me, Michael Sweet, Ted Nugent, Sebastian yep. Bach, Paul Stanley, Corey Taylor. There's there's about 10 people that are always on there but and none of it makes any sense like who gives a fuck if you smoke that was a that was a whole blabbermouth article i read about <laughs> Tom <laughs> smokes a apparently everybody because you know oh he's gonna ruin his voice he's gonna this and that oh look what happened to this look what happened to that it's like listen guys number also, one yeah there was no. also that rumor about uh your singing to uh tapes that was going around for a while right <laughs> oh god <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That guy, that it, it was a guy in Texas that said, you know, um, cause like when I would like, here's a perfect example is like the song enforce. So I go, it goes enforcer and I go enforcer. It's this high octave. Right. And I sing the high note and then our sound guy throws a delay and then he backs the delay off. So it'll go for sir. Ah, ah, ah. Well, people still hear the note when the mic is away from my mouth. Now, I'm not still singing the note. It's the delay of the note I already sang. And and so this guy was like, oh, you know, it sounded so good. And he thought I was lip syncing to tracks because apparently the performance was that good. <laughs> and and I was like, 
you know what? That's a great compliment. If you think that I'm faking it, um, you know, that's that's a testament to to the live performance if they think that I'm doing that. But yeah, there's a there's an know, obsession, dude. Every, you know, everybody's got some opinion. I don't I don't I don't even care about the, you know, the, it's look, a lot of it's just yellow press. Yeah, it's not real journalism and it is what it is. But you know what? I mean, you're out there. I the, I could have worse problems where I could have something really valid to say and 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 it doesn't get picked up. So if I had to weigh the two, it's like, come on, man. I did a two hour interview about all this cool stuff and all you're talking. You know, you screenshot the perfect time where I'm doing <laughs> Right. Todd fucking smoke, so we gotta keep we okay. gotta put it all over right. mouth. Yeah, so they make a thing out of it. But I, I really don't care. It kind of makes me laugh. Like like we'll laugh about it. And it's just kind of funny to me. But but yeah, it seems like you know, I'm definitely watched uh everything I say and I guess when nobody gives a shit about what I say, that's then you a worry. problem. Right, right. So, you know, if 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 Blabbermouth wants to say what they want to say and put me in a headline, you know. Sorry, I went off on a tangent, but I had to ask you that. No. Every time I open it up, I'm like, shit, there he is again. Dude, one time it was funny because <laughs> we were out to dinner. It was me and Michael and Zeus. And this was when the governor of Texas did something ridiculous. I don't even remember what it was. And I said, uh, and we were eating and I was like, you know, you, you know, ignorant effing asshole, Texas governor, blah, blah, blah. And it was like 830. And I said to Zeus, watch by nine o'clock. This will be on. This will be there. And it was and he kept checking right when he got to nine. He it was 902 yeah. and it was and it was on. <laughs> That's great. But you know what? I'm not going to not say what I want to say because I'm worried that it will get twisted. No. The shit will get twisted anyway. Right. And so the people that really the, the smart people will read the interview or listen to it and put it in context and they'll realize like the smoking thing people were like and i even say in that interview like look it's bad for you it's it's a bad habit right i get it but xyz right and they're like oh this this fucking loser can go smoking <laughs> i even made a joke i was like hey pavarotti smoked Till the day he died. You know? oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I hate to interrupt, but we've got like three minutes on this 40 minute Zoom call. Okay, well, well, wait, 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 wait. So, I have the ultimate blabbermouth question. Please. This will definitely get picked up because it'll be funny. <laughs> if I answer it. Todd it says, is. oh, you got to answer it. No, no, start a no, column. no. It's fine. Todd no, it's says. cool. So what do you think of D. Schneider, Alex Skolnick, and Tracy Guns doing We're Not Going to Take It for Beto in Texas? What do you mean? They're collaborating? They're getting together to play that song at a rally for Beto. Fuck it. Let them do it. I <laughs> First of all, you know, I love that D. Snyder stands up for rights. And he was one of these guys. He was a pioneer in championing alongside Zappa. That, that PMRC, those, yeah. Bingo. So this guy's all about freedom of speech and X, Y, Z. Um I love Alex Skolnick. He's a friend of mine. I love his playing. I'm a huge Testament fan. Everybody knows that. Um, who was the other guy? Tracy Guns. Tracy Guns. I don't know him, but, you know, respect him as a musician. It, look, at the at, first and foremost, we're just human beings. We're people that, that happen to play music. And a lot of people say you should keep your, your political views out of music, out of the the sphere of your 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 artistic realm or entertainment we don't want to hear about it no if it aligns with yours you don't mind when it doesn't align with yours now you think we should all shut up and probably the most un-american thing you can do is tell somebody to shut up about their opinion because we have the first amendment when one of those right. things under that amendment is freedom of speech sure and Anyone so look, your opinion to matter anyway if and the thing is is like if it's a cause that they believe in, it's not hurting anyone. It's not infringing on anyone's rights. If they're okay with whatever potential backlash that would cause, number one, they already know that because they're in the press all the time about their viewpoints and I support their viewpoints. I, I happen to be in great alignment with Alex Skolnick all the time. 
about things and we message each other funny shit and you know we joke about it they're, they're human beings they could do what they want and let's not forget the the 60s you know there were so many songs that had to do with politics and the war and rights and everything else so i think it, it's their it's their art it's their medium if they want to go support a candidate with their music of a version of whatever you know knock yourself out i followed him on twitter and i was like he was like, oh, it's the 35th anniversary of when I did my thing in front of Congress. So I went back and watched it. The whole, his whole testimony, it was like 35 minutes or whatever. And like everyone was showing up in suits and ties and everything. And he walks in like full hair, jean jacket, leather, like, and he sits down and they're all like, oh, God. You know, and he just schooled them. <laughs> I remember that being live. Like, that was a thing when we grew up, right? They weren't expecting someone that looks like that to, to be educated on the issues and speak with an articulate, you know, speak articulately. So, yeah, I mean, that guy, you know, he did his homework and he knows what he's doing. And, uh, you know, the beautiful thing about it is if you don't like it, don't watch. Yeah. And and I'm sure he could give two shits and he probably doesn't want his audience to be the demographic that's like, fuck you. Why are you doing that? He he's probably like, you know what? Do me a favor. Don't follow me. I don't <laughs> want I don't right. want your support. <laughs> but it also keeps him in the news as well. Right. I mean, it's still he's in the news, just like, you know, Todd smokes. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce just won't let that one go. No, because it bothers <laughs> me. I've been wanting to ask you that for the longest time because Every time I log on, I see that stuff and I'm like, what the heck? Oh, geez. Yeah. 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 No. Just don't don't go into the comment sections. That's where it gets dirty. Yeah, I could care. I don't even care about it. <laughs> That's all okay. I've got, Todd. I know we got a, a No, dude, it's connection. all good. Listen, I appreciate the time. It's good to see you. Your hair's growing out. Looks yes. good. Thank you. I'm so jealous. Good of to you see fuckers. you as well. <laughs> and and you know, anytime you guys want to just hang, we can just hang sometime. It's it's all good. But uh yeah, so um, there'll be another video coming out very soon. So keep your eyes and ears out for that. Sweet. And um, check and see if we're in your neck of the woods. We'll be out uh, with Judas Priest for six weeks. Then we're going to do a full ground tour to support the record the beginning of next year, early early part of next year. Then we got a ton of fly dates in the meantime. And yeah, so October 7th is the new record on Century Media and Hopefully your audience will will be interested in checking it out. I'm sure they will. Before I, we I go, you... I just got to say the show in D.C. was fucking killer when you guys pl opened for Priest. It was so good. I, I don't remember where that was. <laughs> it was the at the casino. Yeah, it was at the casino. It was supposed to be at the Anthem, which I was really excited about. But it was at the casino in, in uh, uh, God, I can't even remember the name of the area. But anyways, it was D.C. basically. Well, thanks for coming out. Yeah, and I was shocked to see Andrew doing sound for you guys. I've known Andrew for years. Okay, yeah, he's our TM and our sound guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. So you know what? If we're in your area, just hit him up. I will. Cool. Sure. All right, Bruce, see you guys. Thanks so much. Cheers. All right, see you, Chris. Be well, yeah, my friend. You. Take care. Bye. Later. Hello out there. Yes, hello out there, everyone. I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. Together we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi-weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Nimba the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you!